Good morning. This is the Keeping It Real Sunday School class from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri. I'm Dr. Max Thornsberry and I am the teacher and my wife Brenda will be reading the scriptures this morning from the Authorized Version, the King James Version of the Bible. We are studying a lesson today about obeying God's Word. And we need to establish something here that we are not bound by the law. We'll read some verses that point that out. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Galatia and also to the church of the Romans. Um, yet, you know, we don't much like that word obey. And what we are in the New Testament is we are to be conformed to the image of Christ through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to compel us to obey what the truth of the Word is. But we are not bound by the law. The Apostle Paul said no man can keep the law. The law is a curse unto man. And uh, it doesn't mean that we're free to sin. It doesn't mean the law is not perfect, because it is. The reason that Christ was an acceptable sacrifice um, for our sin was he kept every bit of the law, every jot and tittle. Um, We've got to be a little bit careful when we use this word obey. All right? I don't like it much. My kids didn't like it much. But it is important that we abide and live by the Word of God. Now we're going to look at what the, what the brother of Jesus, James, it's not the Apostle James. The Apostle James was the first of the apostles martyred by Herod and he was killed with the sword. This James was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple and beat to death with staves. This is the half-brother. The lesson writer keeps saying, boy, I don't know why they like to use that term, half-brother, half-brother. His mom and his dad was the same as Jesus' mom and dad, right? Well, except that Jesus was, you know, conceived supernaturally. Yeah, half of his DNA is from the Holy Spirit. Yes. But they're brothers. Yes. And James is mentioned in uh, the book of Matthew, he became a Christian uh, during the time of Christ's 40 days on the earth after his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, and he became a primary leader, the primary leader of the First Baptist Church at Jerusalem. James is writing here to Christian Jews, and he's writing as a Jew to Jews. And his language can be a little harsh. We've already been through a pretty good study of the book of James, but you're going to see today that this is not the Apostle Paul writing. Um, he's blunt. James is blunt and to the point, demanding. Um, so as we examine this, let's see how we might apply this living Word of God, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through his brother James to how we are to approach the Word of God. And so, Brenda, I want you to start with James chapter 1 and read verses 19 through 21. Now, I want to make one point clear here. James is addressing Christians. He's addressing activity in the church, okay. not necessarily addressing activity out of the church. I mean, we do the will of God when we do His Word, but I think we were doing the will of God when my um, uncle Kenneth and Harlan Riley and Others that I knew as a child went to Europe and fought the Germans and mm -hmm. subdued them and returned freedom. I think they're doing the wrath of God, the will of God. Mm -hmm. But this refers to trying to apply the wrath of God in the church. That's not our responsibility. Okay? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, put a Put away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Well, this is pretty profound scripture, where James says the engrafted word of God is able to save your souls. Now, can I just take this Bible, Brendan, hold it up to my chest, hug it tight, and say I'm saved? Oh, uh, no. No. It's not an idol, is it? No. It's the living Word of God. Mm -hmm. But it contains the gospel. Yes. And as we read it and study it, the gospel saves us. Mm -hmm. The Holy mm -hmm. Spirit convicts of sin, points to righteousness in Jesus Christ, and we're saved. 
I think the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10 that if we confess with our mouth, Christ said we have to confess before men, uh, and we believe in our heart, mm -hmm. thou shalt be saved. Yes. So how does that come about? The Apostle Paul said it also came about by the study of the Word. Mm -hmm. We're going to see James use some very marvelous words to describe the Gospel, mm -hmm. how significant it is, how beautiful it is. Remember that um, the Apostle Paul used those words from Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those that carry the good news. Mm -hmm. This Bible is capable of providing salvation yes. as we read it, study it, absorb it, and the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Mm -hmm. Now we must remember that no man can be saved outside of the Holy Spirit's conviction. Correct. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, No man can call Jesus Lord mm -hmm. except by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's not a mental thing. It has to come into us mentally. Mm -hmm. It's one reason why it's so very important that we be literate. It's why our founding fathers established a school system. It's why the Jews sent their children to school until they were 12 or 13 years old. Um, it's important for us to be literate in order to read the Word, to absorb the Word, word but it's the Holy Spirit that reveals the truth of the Word. Mm -hmm. But notice what he says. This engrafted Word is able to save your souls. How does the Word get engrafted, and what does engrafted really mean? What do we well, talk about when we say we had a skin graft or we grafted a fruit tree? What does that mean? Um, well, when I think of engrafted, I think of uh, getting it, reading it, studying it, meditating on it, and it becomes um, part of you. It's up here in this computer so that you can pull it up any time that you need it. So it's not just reading it and then moving on and just, you know, forgetting about it. It's having it in your heart as well as your mind. And it's, it becomes a part of you. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy that the Word of God divides asunder body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. That it makes us understand we are a living soul. That we have a spirit that needs to be saved. Mm -hmm. And with our mind, we comprehend it. Mm -hmm. We understand it. Although I know people have received Christ as Lord and Savior that many people would say we're not super smart. Mm -hmm. We're not super capable mentally. It doesn't take an Einstein to come to know what the Word says. The Word is simple. It's true. We can, you know, I think that James Dobson said he was saved when he was three or four. Yeah. I know that I was five or six. You were too. Um, you don't need to be 150 IQ to understand what the Word says. The Holy Spirit reveals it to you, doesn't it? Yes. Now, are we obeying the Word, Brenda, when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior? Well, uh, yes. Yeah, we're yeah, obeying sure. it, right? We're sure. yielding to it. We're mm -hmm. responding to it. We're obeying what the Word says. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament always pointing to Christ, mm -hmm. and the New Testament always pointing back to His death, burial, and resurrection, and the sacrifice that He did on the cross. He performed Himself of His own free will mm -hmm. for us, yes, for our sins. Shed His blood on Calvary's mountain, mm -hmm. and it washed down off of that mountain. And Ben-Hur's mom and sister had leprosy and were nearly dead and were healed. And also the graves popped open. Yes. And there was a mini resurrection. Oh, that part's true. And they come out and they walked through the streets of Jerusalem and mm -hmm. people saw them, knew them. Powerful, powerful, mm -hmm. powerful time. The veil of the temple, four foot thick veil of many different layers ripped apart from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Thrusting open the Holy of Holies so the whole world now could see this place where God resided. And now the Lord Jesus Christ is the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. God resides in Him and He in us, mm -hmm. not in one little spot over the mercy seat. Um, phenomenal day in history. Miraculous. The day Christ gave His life for us. Mm -hmm. um, he just dressing these people as beloved brethren. Is that pretty uh, personal, Brenda? Well, I don't yes. go around and say, Oh, my beloved brother. Oh, my beloved sister. I, 
Why is he addressing these people that way? Uh, because he, he wants them to know the reason that he's being blunt to them is because he cares for them. He knows them. them. He knows them he and knows he cares them. for them. Be like I might talk to my brother or my mm -hmm. son mm -hmm. more forthrightly, more plainly mm -hmm. than I might somebody that I'm just an acquaintance with. Yeah. These are special people. These are personal friends. And they're having trouble in the church. Mm -hmm. um, you've got some people that imagine think... That. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> uh, you have some people think that they have all the knowledge and all the wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you have some people think that these people are wrong, they're going astray, and we're going to bring the wrath of God down on them to get them straightened up. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that's not the way it works. You are not the instrument of God's wrath in the church. Right. Now... Does that mean we don't stand up for what's right? Of course Would not. Would you have someone who's having adultery teach a Sunday school class? No, you should not. Um, the Apostle Paul addresses this both in First and Second Corinthians, that there is a time for leaders of the church, particularly deacons and pastor, to stand up and say, this is not right. You cannot have this position of leadership, of authority, of teaching, of ministry in the church with this sin in your life. Now, we're all sinful, right? Not yes. anybody free of sin. None are righteous, no, not one. But you can't have these flagrant sins of the flesh in operation and have a position in the church. No. But you do it lovingly, right? Of course. Um, with, the, with the goal to, of restoration. Yeah, the goal is to restore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't happen that way very much. No, I can tell you no, from my years of experience, people generally just continue in what they want to do. But he says, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughty and naughtiness. There are people in the church that are not living up to the apostle or to uh, James, the brother of Christ, understanding. They are not living up to the standard that the church has. But he's asking them not to be the wrath of God, not to let their anger come hard against them. But notice what he says, receive with meekness the engrafted word because it's able to save your souls. Mm -hmm. Not only is it able to save your souls, but later on James says it covers a multitude of sin mm -hmm. by doing that right thing. Now there was sin in the church, there was sin in the leadership, there was sin taking place, and James wanted it addressed. Mm -hmm. He wanted to dress. Notice that he uses very plain language. When you lay apart or lay aside something, what do you do with it? When you lay it aside? Yeah. Um, What's he mean by that? Wherefore, lay apart. What's that? What do you think that means? What's the emphasis there? Get it out of your sight. Yeah. Remove it. Get it away. Mm -hmm. Flee from the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw mm -hmm. nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. He's mm -hmm. going to write here in a few minutes in this very portion of Scripture. So um, I want you to turn to a few New Testament Scriptures here, Brenda, that kind of follow up. I think we'll wait until we read this next set of Scriptures before we do that. If you would read uh, 22 through 25, James chapter 1. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and immediately forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth in it, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now this perfect law of liberty is a synonym for the gospel. And in Christ, we have liberty. Mm -hmm. I, I've given a whole sermon before RCAF mm -hmm. concerning our liberty, which is in Christ. We're not bound by the law. We're not bound by customs. We're not bound by holidays. We're not bound by moons. We're not bound by all the things the Jewish faith was bound by to demonstrate the coming of the Messiah mm -hmm. because he's come. Mm -hmm. He's died on the cross. He was buried. He rose on the third day and sits at the right hand throne of God. We're not bound by those things. Are those things good to study? And Yeah, because they're revealing what's going to happen when the Messiah does come. Um, you know, the Feast of the Booths and all these Day of Atonement and all of that. Yeah, they have a very specific point because they're pointing to Christ. Mm -hmm. 
But we are not bound by those times, those days. The Apostle Paul writes to Colossians, you know, you're not bound by these things. We are free in Christ. Um, yet some people like to be bound. Mm -hmm. And he's saying here, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be what? Blessed. Blessed in his deed. Again, we almost see this beatitude type mm -hmm. of language, don't you? Yeah. He is happy. He is blessed. Um, if we will abide in the perfect liberty that we have in Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to guide, direct us, move us, conform us to the image of Christ, we'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Be happy and blessed. Um, what do you think doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving your own selves what do you think well, he means by that if you read what you should do if you if you read in scripture the things that you are supposed to do and you just read them and forget them and don't do any of them nobody nobody prospers in that or nobody profits from that so you have to be, you have to read the Word and the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit encourages you to do something, you do it. You don't just slough it off and say, that, that, that doesn't mean me, that means everybody else, doesn't mean me. If you're being encouraged by the Holy Spirit to do whatever it is, then you need to do it. And doesn't this really separate someone who has just hidden Head knowledge? knowledge. From someone that has heart knowledge. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, the devils believe, don't they? Sure. The demons believe and tremble, sure. but they don't do what the Word says. They're in total opposition to God. They're part of the enemy's kingdom, mm -hmm. not Christ's kingdom, mm -hmm. yet they know. Yeah. The devil knows the Word. He used it to tempt Jesus three times, and Jesus repeated back Word to him. Um, I don't really know for sure. You know, he's going a little bit later say that true religion is those that take care of widows and children. You don't just say to someone that is in need, God bless you. Mm -hmm. Hope the best for you. Mm -hmm. You meet the need yes. in some fashion you, or yeah, another. Yeah, if you possibly can, you do. Um, that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. We cannot be just hearers of the Word and have head knowledge. But if the Holy Spirit is in us, we've taken Christ as our Savior, we're truly saved, the Holy Spirit will move and guide us and direct us to action. Yes. And it's going to be Holy Spirit-directed action. It's not going to be humanitarian action mm -hmm. or you, you know, something that you're doing just because you think it's the right thing to do. You're going to mm -hmm. do it because the Holy Spirit directs you. And then what does the Apostle Paul say? That's gold and silver and precious stone that mm -hmm. survives the test of time, test of fire. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, We're going to read Colossians 4.16. I've got several New Testament verses we're going to go through here. Colossians, Colossians 4.16, I think. Yeah. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye also read the epistle from Laodicea. So most of the people that are going to, they didn't have the ability to make books then, all mm -hmm. right? There was right. no printing press. Right. Everything had to be handwritten, put mm -hmm. in a scroll, rolled up. And the way most of these people heard the, the content of this Bible in the New Testament is somebody got up in the synagogue, rolled out the scroll, and read, read it, it to it. them. Mm -hmm. So you can see what he's meaning. You don't get to just get down and get that scroll down and study this for yourself. You've got to hear it and let the Holy Spirit work it in your system and make you a doer of the Word. That's what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. When you get this, read it. And the one I wrote to Laodiceans, read it too. Mm -hmm. You're going to read it. You're going to hear it. Somebody's going to read it to you. And then, Brenda, if you would read uh, Luke 4, 16 through 21, this is where Jesus read from the 
from the scroll of Isaiah, Luke 4, 16 through 21. And, and as these people were allowed to sit in the seat of Moses in the synagogue, they were given the scroll. They had the right to turn in where they wanted, and they read it. Notice how Jesus is reading this word. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering sight to the blind, so set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This is the day, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now notice he stood up to read it. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean every time scripture is read in church you need to stand up. But why do you think he did that? Well, for one thing, um, so people could see yeah, so that he was reading and so and they hear could him. hear him. And hear yes. him. There wasn't any public speaking system. Right. And these synagogues were not huge, but you had people sitting all the way around. Mm -hmm. He had the seat of Moses, which is up on one side. He takes the scroll, he stands up, he reads it so they can hear it. Mm -hmm. um, this day, this scripture fulfilled in your very sight, mm -hmm. in your in very your ears. ears. Yeah. And then turn to Galatians 2, Brenda, and read verse 21. Keep your keep your Galatians open there too. I do not make void the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And then Galatians three twenty four. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So our salvation is not in keeping the law, which no. we might think of when we think of obeying the word. Um, but it's in Christ. Our salvation is through faith, by grace, um, so that no man can boast, right? Mm -hmm. He writes uh, to the Ephesians. Um, read Romans 8, 1 through 4, please. And he says that the uh, Old Testament is like a schoolmaster. It's pointing us to Christ. It's teaching us what is right and wrong. It's teaching God's standards. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So our righteousness is in Christ. Mm -hmm. It's in His blood. He fulfilled every bit of the law, every jot and tittle, He said. Mm -hmm. He said He would preserve God's law, pre preserve the Word of God. It means it's... Um, very, very important to understand the Word of God. But our salvation does not come through keeping the law. It comes through Christ. Yes. He kept it for us. Mm -hmm. He did what we cannot do, in other words. And then Ephesians 2, uh, 8 through 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so our salvation is a gift, yes. a gift from God, mm -hmm. not of works, not of obeying the law, not of doing this, 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 and this. Cannot be earned. Cannot be earned. Very, very important point. There's not any series of things you can do that would earn you... Um, 
won't earn you salvation, but it also will not fulfill God's wrath against sin before you're saved, right. no matter how good a person you are. Mm -hmm. um, you remember that, and I say this a lot, John the Baptist in the latter part of John, the Gospel of John chapter 3, says, Behold, the Lamb of God mm -hmm. who takes away the sins of the world. You either believe on Him and have eternal light, life, or you do not believe on Him and the wrath of God abides on you still. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing that removes God's wrath against sin. Mm -hmm. That's the blood of Jesus. Correct. That's salvation. Mm -hmm. Period. Yes. Keeping the law is certainly not going to do it. And then let's go back to James 1, Brenda, and read 26 through 27, please. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now you had people in this church, Brenda, that uh, felt like they were just a whole lot better Christian than anybody else. Mm -hmm their knowledge of the Word, their understanding of the Gospel, their position of leadership. Maybe they were orators, which was a very highly uh, sought after and recognized skill in the Greek culture. They could stand up and expound on the Scripture. And he's saying here, listen, you know, all that's good and well, mm -hmm. but what are you really doing that is going to identify you as a Christian? Mm -hmm. And he says, true religion. Isn't that what he says? Pure. Pure. Do you think that he means perfect, sinless religion? What do you think he means by that word pure? Um, when I think of something that's pure, I think that it's innocent, uh, clean, um, not looking for recognition. Yeah, what he really means there is a religion not based on works. Mm -hmm. It means a pure religion. He's speaking about putting all your faith and trust in Christ, that Christ has paid the price. There's not anything you can do to work yourself up to be some higher level. You know, he's going to later on talk about humility and say God's no respecter of persons. That's what he's working up to. True religion is not a hierarchy in the church. Correct. Somebody's here and has this authority, and he has power and authority over you. Mm -hmm. And that you can gain God's favor by doing what he tells you to do, maybe this many recit recitations or whatever. Um, go out and do this many things. Mm -hmm. um, that's what he's talking about there. It's not um, pure, true, honest, right religion is complete and total faith in Christ. Yes. All right. Um, read First Timothy 5, verse 3, please. First Timothy 5, mm -hmm. verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Are you sure that's, that's what That's exactly <laughs> right. Okay. Because <laughs> he's just said that pure religion is what? Addressing the needs of the widows and mm -hmm. orphans. Mm -hmm. God, I'm not going to go back in the Old Testament and read all these Old Testament verses, but some of this comes from Isaiah, comes from Jeremiah, uh, Hosea, over and over and over. Uh, he says, you're letting the foreigner and the widow and the orphan starve, mm -hmm. and yet you're seeking God, you're seeking me mm -hmm. to bless you. Mm -hmm. These things must be taken care of. These things must be addressed. Uh, and really, James is talking to a group of people that should know the Old Testament forwards and backwards, and they know that God shines His favor on those that do right by those in need. Mm -hmm. Instead of having this lorded over everybody attitude, what are you doing out here to prove that you are truly saved? Mm -hmm. What are, can people see in your life to know that you put your full faith and trust in Christ and you're not depending on your Jewish heritage or your money or your profession? Some of these people were in certain kinds of guilds very highly respected uh, professions. Um, no, it's not that. Pure religion, true religion, honest religion, just religion is someone that's going to take care of those in need. In this case, he uses orphans and widows again. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think the Apostle Paul meant 
uh, a widow indeed. Well, someone who has truly lost their spouse, yeah, their husband. Yeah, but it's a widow it's who has lost their spouse that's really in need. In need, yes. In the Roman Empire, yeah. the woman, believe it or not, inherited. Here, here it's okay. it, verse 4 Read explains it. it. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So in the Roman Empire, the wife would inherit what the husband had. Mm -hmm. And a widow could actually be very wealthy. Mm -hmm. She could have all the property, the, the slaves, uh, gold, uh, chariots, horses, and uh, He's talking about here a widow that's a widow and she doesn't have any family, there's no, no sons, no nephews, nobody to care for. Yeah. Then it's the church's responsibility to meet that need. Correct. That's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, Brenda, what do we get out of this? Obey yeah. God's Word. What do we get out of it? What's the primary obeying, honoring, yielding to that we should do? Well, I think it, it, the first thing that popped in my mind is not to be just a hearer or a reader of the word, but to actually put action with with what you have learned. And the primary thing we do to obey the word that has eternal significance is to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, to yield that's to the, the gospel. Yes, that's the first. Yeah, that's the first point. If you don't get that, then nothing the else rest matters. Rest of it is just superfluous, right? Superfluous. 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 Superfluity of knowledge. Well, fluid, that's, that's, uh, mine didn't have that particular word. Yeah, it, it changed it, called an overflowing yeah, of. Yeah. Okay, um, one thing we need to do is if we have sin the Holy Spirit's been working on us about, we need to confess it and get on. You know, one of the things that causes great consternation and difficulty in the church is not having any accountability. Correct. I'm accountable to people in my church. I'm mm -hmm. accountable to my other deacons. I'm accountable to you. I'm accountable, accountable to my pastor. Um, and if I get to doing something or involved in something that they know I shouldn't be doing, they're going to come and talk to me about it. They're I expect gonna, they will. Yeah, I expect they will. Uh, the other is to commit. Commit to mm -hmm. obey the Word. Commit to do what the Word says. One of the things that you need to be doing first obey the word, in my opinion, is to be tithing. Um, I don't disagree with that. And because if you're tithing, then the church has the funds to minister to the orphans and widows Correct. properly. Correct. You're going to be doing what God wants you to do. Mm -hmm. Have God's favor for doing the right thing. If mm -hmm. you're not tithing, um, you're saying my money's more important than what God wants for me. Uh, pocketbook's the last vesture of uh, independence in the church because people won't yield it to God. No. And that's the thing that uh, I think is one of the issues where we're not obeying the Word. The other is, um, there, are there times to, to seek counsel from other Christians? Of course. What would one or two of those things be? Oh. Because James is giving these men and women, these Jewish men and women, counsel here. My daughter would say, He's a good counselor. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. telling them what he sees wrong and what he wants corrected, and he's using the completeness of the gospel to get it done. Mm -hmm. Are there times we need to counsel people? Uh, well, yes. Uh, that's you know, those are very um, personal things. It could be, you know, discord have, discord in a marriage maybe you know, uh, maybe a divorce on the horizon don't you all have kinds to of things have some humility to receive counseling oh absolutely don't you have to have an attitude of accountability to receive counseling of course yeah you got to know that um, i think people who need counseling know they need counseling but a lot of it has to do with pride and uh, not being willing to you know, a lot of people. Oh, yeah, I want you to want you to give me some advice, and then they look at you and say, "Okay," and then never never follow through. Not that advice is always perfectly correct, 
but still, um, if you ask somebody's advice, be prepared to hear what they've yep. got to say. <laughs> I've had numerous occasions in my working and traveling and being around with a lot of different people that really didn't act like they were Christians when they should, and things go wrong in their life to come to me and say, Doc, I need to talk to you about something. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they did that? Well, I think they recognize in you that, that uh, you're willing to talk to them, willing to listen. Willing and to listen and, and willing to do what the Word asked me to do. Correct. I'm not going to strip joints. I'm not getting drunk. I'm not flirting with other women. I'm not, not that I am perfect by any means. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> but if our lifestyle doesn't reflect our obedience to the Holy Spirit, other people are going to know that and they're going to see it. Mm -hmm. I, sure. People used to work for me got to hear some language sometimes that probably wasn't the most appropriate language for a deacon to use, and I've got better and better at that. But uh, we lose our ability to counsel someone mm -hmm. if we don't live in obedience to the Word. Correct. If the Lord is going to be able to use us and the Holy Spirit's going to be able to use us to counsel, People have to see something in you that they would respect the counseling of. Correct. And that's why it's so very important to try to live in obedience to the Word. Well, that's enough counseling. Okay. It's enough All right. counseling. All right. All right. Never see you mind. next week. <laughs>